So for those who haven't already, please can you fill out the pre-course questionnaire? This is part of some research that we're doing into the course and how it's benefiting your understanding of the AFP. We will cover all aspects of the AFP or the SFP in the webinar series, so it'd be really helpful if you guys can fill this out, not only so that you can get access to our mock interviews that we're running in the future, but also so we can see how we can improve the course and make it better for you guys throughout. Uh, just running through the agenda today, um, I'll be doing an introduction to the SFP. I'm an academic FT working in Seven. Uh, this is the first um, in a series that we're going to be doing this year. Um, then Prof uh, Professor Hinchcliffe, the head of surgery AFP in Seven, has agreed to talk about his career and what his opinions in the Specialised Foundation programme are. Then finally, we have speakers from around the UK and throughout the academic pathway who will give you guys a bit of an idea about what their experience of the SFP programme was like. Um, so we in this webinar series, we're going to break down all the different aspects of the SSP and teach you how to best maximise your chances of getting in. We've also added a new webinar into our series this year that helps you to decide which AFP, whether it's education, leadership or research you fancy doing, um, which will be really beneficial for you guys. So really what we're going to cover in over the webinar series and in the webinar today is what, uh, why you want to do the SFP, where you can do it and what the key dates are and finally how you can go about it. There will be a huge range of people attending today. We've had sign-ups from first year to final year. Um, so for those who aren't aware, when you graduate from med school across two years, you do six four-month clinical rotations in your FY1 and FY2 to help you gain your competencies, how to operate as a doctor before you go off on your chosen path. This is just a kind of typical example of what your foundation program training might be like. In terms of getting to foundation, you have two different um, kind of factors that create your score. You have your EPM score, which is out of 50, which is determined by your performance in medical school, according to your decile range that goes between 41 points and 50 points. This has recently changed compared to previous years where additional prizes, publications and degrees count towards the score, but this has been removed and it is just done on your performance in medical school now. Then the SJT is an exam where, that everyone does in their final year, which assesses kind of on general competencies within medicine and really evaluates how you think in your decision making. And this represents the other 50% of your training score. What happens is then you rank all the deaneries in the country from your first choice to your last choice. Then you get allocated to a deanery based on this score, and then you have to rank all of the jobs in the deanery. So it is a bit of a gamble which jobs you're going to get. The Academic Foundation Training, or the SFP, um, which it's now known as, is another route that you can do, which is a different in the way that it offers dedicated research, education or leadership time. The most common format is where one of the six four month rotations was replaced by a dedicated research time. Um, this can vary between clinical day release and other formats that we'll talk about throughout the talk. So the application for the SFP is actually separate from the normal foundation application and happens before foundation programme applications go in. This takes into account your EPM score in order to shortlist you for an interview, but also takes into consideration things like prizes, publications and presentations to help you shortlist you for interviews. Um, some academic units of application or deaneries uh, that provide the specialised foundation programme will also allow you to write a personal statement of sorts, which is in the format of white space questions. These are a kind of short essay, which is 200 to 300 words, answering three to five different questions. Then you go for an interview, um, which is around uh, November to December time of the application year. However, unfortunately, the application is quite work intensive. And there's not a whole lot of transparency about how to maximise your chances of how you get in. And this is where the course that we've created has come from. 
So these are different variations of how academic time can be split. Um, and you can generally have academic day release or a dedicated research block. So what's the purpose of the SSP program? It was initially developed to give people exposure to research, leadership or educational activities. And it can also form part of the NIHR Integrated Academic Pathway, which Kitty, one of our speakers who you'll hear from later, is on the track of at the moment. However, it can also just be used as an opportunity to experience research, leadership or education. There are a few different types of AFP or SFP available. It's good to note that the title has actually changed from AFP to SFP two years ago now um, to kind of encompass more that there's a research and a leadership and management side as well, in addition to this research block. Um, so unfortunately, Seven, which is the deanery I'm in, I think exclusively offers research. However, other deaneries will also have medical education and leadership and management SFPs. Something to bear in mind with all of these is that doing a particular style of SFP doesn't exclude you from doing any of these other things. They all contribute something that the qualities of a clinical academic require. Ultimately, the GMC kind of wants doctors to be a researcher and a leader and a teacher. And so kind of doing any one of these programs will benefit you hugely in the future. So why should you consider doing an SFP? There are a few different pros and cons. Firstly, you get an experience of clinical academia. It gives you a really good amount of time to consider or dip your toe in the water and realize, do you want to do research, leadership or um, education in the future? And you have that dedicated research time set aside to make the most of that. You also have access to academics, and this has been hugely valuable to me in particular. And I think having that access, you can really get a lot out of that. You're also funded, so you can get funding for your research project and you can get funding to go to things like conferences. So you can build up your CV and do presentations and also possibly funding for publications as well. Um, as part of the interview process, you'll need to do revision of your acute situations, which can be really helpful for finals. I personally found having to go through those um, kind of um, management of acute asthma like multiple times really helpful. It also gives you interview experience, which a lot of your colleagues won't have until they reach kind of IMT3 or CT2 level. Um, so that can be really beneficial. And Finally, the AFP doesn't actually interfere with the foundation program application. So why wouldn't you really go for it? I mean, on the con side, clinical academia can be more demanding and there is an expectation that you would produce outputs of publications, prizes or presentations. And the time management can be more difficult um, because you've got this expectation. Uh, the application is in addition to the foundation program and can be harder and more time consuming. And because you often have day release or a dedicated academic block, you have less time than your colleagues for the same clinical competencies. So where can you do this? There are 15 different units of application and they are all listed um, on the UK FPO website, which has a lot of information about different deaneries. Our website, the accessthefp.com, also has a huge um, wealth of information about the different deaneries and what they provide. Um, ultimately, you can only select two units to apply to, and we'll talk about this further in our other webinars, but really it comes down to a personal decision about where you want to be, who you want to work with, and what educational activities you want to do. So here are some of the key dates for this year. Um, this is taken from the UK FPO website on the Specialised Foundation page. We run our course alongside this timeline so you can get maximal information um, about the application before your application needs to go in. These are some of the links that will give you a bit more information about when things are going to happen. So firstly, you need to decide, do you want to do the Specialised Foundation programme? 
Uh, these are some of the key things that you need to do and consider. So if you're in the early years of med school, this is a really good time to think about whether you want to do the SFP and build your CV and also decide, do you like teaching, leadership or research? What the Access the FFP programme does is we provide tips on how to get you these things, ace your white space questions and also a little bit about what deaneries you might want to select. We'll also give you tips on how to do really well in your interviews and we also run mock interviews in November and December which went really well last year and were very oversubscribed. And most importantly, we all uh, we do this all for free. So I think the key thing for you guys to think about is kind of why would you not apply? It is effort to put the application in, but you don't lose anything from it. And ultimately, you can also learn from doing the application itself, even if you don't do an SFP in the end. It will only be something that you benefit from. And I wouldn't be discouraged if you feel like you don't have um, any or publications, presentations or prizes or as many as your peers, and you may not have been the top ranking at medical school. However, the SFP is ultimately an opportunity to explore medical research, leadership or education, and you do not need to have any or all of these things to participate. So these are the key dates for the webinars that we'll be holding in the future. Um, and if you'd like a thorough answer to any of the questions we have, we'll be doing a Q&A at the end. And also if you're posting your questions in the chat, hopefully our moderators are getting through them. This is just a little bit about me. And we'll run a few questions at the end. So now I'd love to introduce you to Professor Hinchcliffe. He's the lead for the Surgery Specialised Foundation Programme in Bristol and North Bristol Trust. He's been incredibly supportive to the Access the SFP group and also incredibly supportive to me as my academic supervisor. So it's my pleasure to hand you over to Prof Hinchcliffe. Thanks, Maya, um, and, and the rest of the team, and particularly to P.T. Wong and Con Moore, who helped set up this fantastic initiative a few years ago now. And um, I, I think they realised the opportunity and, and the complexities of the foundation programme, particularly the academic foundation programme, in that there's a lot of things to think about. Uh, and it's not something that you can simply turn up on the day and expect to be appointed to this sort of post. Uh, it needs quite a lot of preparation and thought. And I think the team have done a really great job in really sort of setting out exactly what you need to do uh, to put yourself in a good position to be able to get this post, or maybe just to kind of give you the information uh, for you to decide that this isn't for you. So um, ultimately, I'm not going to go into too much detail about the SFP or the AFP. Suffice to say that it's a really pretty competitive process. Uh, and various aspects of your CV are going to be explored within the application uh, and the team have done a great job in sort of really setting you up for that um, and it's something that you as I alluded to really need to prepare for particularly well uh, and, and it's something that actually probably even within the early years of, um, of medical school uh, you, you could be really well um, well versed by attending this. So why, why is there a separate academic training path? Well, a, a number of years ago, uh, probably around the sort of early 2000s, uh, there was a recognition that the UK was perhaps slipping behind the rest of the world in terms of its um, position as a sort of clinical academic powerhouse. Um, and certainly when I was at your stage, uh, there were very few academics um, and the reasons for that are complex but ultimately there was no specific training program uh, and many academics really struggled with funding and then along came NIHR and the NIHR was really a great initiative because suddenly it made um, clinical academic medicine uh, um, sort of available uh, it started to provide funding uh, and uh, clinical trials suddenly became, and uh, clinical research suddenly became really important. Up until that point, and certainly when I was at your stage, the only researchers that I came across were those people who were solely based in the lab 
uh, and uh, really it was all about basic science. Uh, and that translated um, into really a lack of clinical academics um, uh, in the UK. At, at the time of the NIHR was introduced, um, where there was an expectation that more high quality clinical research would be done, uh, the government and the NIHR recognized that in order to deliver high quality clinical research, you needed clinical academics and you needed to train those clinical academics. You couldn't just expect them just to, to pitch up uh, and, and uh, you know, do all these large scale clinical trials uh, without training people. And around 2008, um, someone called Mark Walport, um, who later was, was knighted and became the uh, chief scientific officer, uh, introduced the uh, clinical academic training pathway. And the first part of that, or really the preliminary phase of that, was the academic foundation program. And you saw the um, uh, you saw effectively the kind of Gantt chart that Mayer puts up there. There are, there are glitches with that, it's not perfect, uh, but at least you can see quite clearly that the SFP or the AFP is really the springboard into clinical academic medicine and gives you that opportunity. Um, I guess now you probably don't want to hear about um, old people's or sort of middle-aged people's uh, journeys, but in, in some ways it gives you a reflection of of what can be possible and uh, the, the way in which you can position yourself well to become a clinical academic. And perhaps it might give you some insights about what a clinical academic does. So I'll, I'll, I'll tell you my journey uh, because it sort of straddled two, two epochs really of, of clinical academic medicine, the pre-Walport era and then the post-Walport era. So and Walport, Mark Walport was this chap who uh, really developed the clinical academic training program. So really in the early stages of my career, uh, really nothing like this existed. You had to show enthusiasm to become um, uh, associated with people with uh, an interest in clinical research. There weren't that many of them around. Uh, and the slight difference then was that you had to have a thesis, a MD or a PhD before you became a registrar. So I, I uh, aligned myself with a, with a professor who was doing some clinical research uh, and my clinical research happened to go particularly well. Uh, and then uh, as a result of that, I, I was then had the opportunity to become one of the first clinical academic lecturers. Um, and really at that stage had the opportunity then to start to get some clinical academic training and to uh, progress my clinical academic training career to become then a senior lecturer um, and then ultimately a professor. Uh, I think the thing to say is, do, you know, do, do I have any tips or suggestions about um, the way in which to get involved? Because clearly um, to do uh, good research and to get your career really jump started, you've got to start to align yourself with people who are doing good clinical research. And, and those are usually uh, professors and, and usually people who have a, an academic training record. Uh, and uh, you can often find those either through word of mouth or uh, local internet searches or uh, discussions within the medical school. Um, and it's really important to align yourself with those teams because once you align yourself with those teams, suddenly doors can open for you. It's very difficult for a lot of the full-time consultants in the NHS to do clinical research because they have so many other things on their plate um, and uh, very little time to do it. So a lot of the academics um, will really believe it or not, show interest in medical students and junior doctors who have an enthusiasm for, um, for things uh, associated with academic research. And I think the enthusiasm is, is the absolute key. Actually, you'd be surprised that uh, most professors still uh, are really quite uh, open to be approached by uh, medical students. And within, uh, within the medical schools, 
there are integrated BSc programs, there are MSc programs, there are PhD programs, and actually those are the sorts of opportunities that you might be able to to, to sort of uh, get to grips with, which might kick, kickstart your career if you've got any interest in a clinical academic uh, training program. So enthusiasm, I think, is a really important trait in people. I think the other important traits are that sort of general inquisitiveness. Uh, you know, uh, are you going to go to the operating theatre where a consultant may be operating and, and ask those difficult questions, challenge dogma, think about things in a slightly... Um, unusual way because we often do things in surgery and medicine which are just done because your boss did them and his boss did them before and uh, her boss did them before that or whatever it may be and then clearly you know that because it's a, a challenging um, uh, a challenging thing to do you've got to be pretty hard working and you've got to be prepared to take uh prepared to take knocks and kind of get up and move on after them. Um, so uh, most, uh, Professor Matt Bowne in Leicester gives a great talk uh, where he is a vascular surgeon like me. He shows a whole slide of um, grants which have been totally unsuccessful on the left-hand side and on the right side, he's got a much smaller list of those grants which were successful. Uh, and it's really it's really uh, hard to to sort of make those applications. They're really time consuming, but you have to pick yourself up and you have to kind of go again and regroup. And and it's that sort of uh, durability uh, that you need. So so it's the enthusiasm, it's the hard work, it's the ability to question dogma and the ability to take those knocks and to move on. We all get that within clinical medicine, but it's perhaps even harder within the academic um, within the academic group. So, what what does a uh, clinical academic uh, surgeon or clinical academics um, life look like? I think it's the greatest opportunity that you've got really to impact the um, the clinical landscape. Uh, and to change the way in which we deliver medicine. As a surgeon, uh, actually, yes, you know, patients come to me with specific problems on an individual basis. I hopefully can fix a number of those problems. But the ability of I've had as a clinical researcher is to change the way in which we practice medicine or practice surgery. And that really is the greatest opportunity I think for, for any doctor is, is really on an individual basis for individual patients yes you can treat those patients but what can you do about the future of every single patient coming through so my research was all about uh, ruptured abdominal aortic aneurysms and the trials that we did really shaped the way in which we deliver surgery for those patients and that was quite a sea change and there are lots of examples like that. Uh, and really it's very difficult to do that if you're a standard consultant. A standard consultant will treat patients coming through uh, and you get a lot of gratification. It's very hard work, uh, but you can really often earn the individual, only influence the patient that's in front of you or several patients. The, the advantage of being a clinical academic is the, the ability to take a completely new perspective uh, and to make and shape the change for, for the future and for the benefit of patients. So it's really important. Um, but my, my um, uh, clinical academic practice is largely split half and half between surgery or surgical uh, medicine uh, and, um, and being a clinical academic. So I will be doing on my, on the time that I'm an ac academic, I'll be doing things like writing things like grant applications, we'll have supervisory meeting with PhD students, um, we will have uh, clinical academic trainees, um, and uh, there'll be lots of interaction with often surgeons, but sometimes other allied health professionals or uh, other specialists or engineers outside of medicine to talk about research projects. And that's a fantastically interesting Thing when you're a clinical academic researcher is, is the opportunity to to meet lots of different people often with really quite off the wall approaches to, to things so statisticians or um, uh, engineers are a good example of that where they have a totally different perspective on things 
um, and you meet lots of people throughout the world uh, and often have the opportunity to go and visit them and see what they're up to because those are the things that often can influence the rest of um, rest of your career but also influence clinical practice and then the rest of my time is split between other other things like you often get involved in editorship of journals like the British Journal of Surgery uh, you get more involved with reviewing grants and to coordinate the um, funding of grants for NIHR and other important uh, organizations and that's also obviously intermingled with your on calls and your operating lists and your, and your clinics which are all incredibly important um, but it's always a balance and, and that's always the difficulty is balancing uh, juggling those two things because clearly they're quite demanding um, and um, you know uh, one will have to manage that situation because your clinical friends or your clinical colleagues will always assume oh well that person's off doing more research and your researchers will say well that person's often doing more clinical work so it's a very fine balance and you'll have to be a good communicator uh, uh to be able to deal with with uh, with those and you'll have to be able to juggle those things and prioritize appropriately but uh, if you were to ask me would i do it all again uh, almost certainly um i think it's a great opportunity and if you have any interest, if you've got that inquisitive mind, if you're enthusiastic, uh, if you want to make a change for large groups of people, uh, if you want to challenge the dogma uh, within clinical medicine or surgery or whatever specialty, then clinical academic medicine's for you. So thank you very much. I'm not sure whether we want to take any questions then. I mean, I think there are a few, a few questions in the chat. Um, Let's have a look. Um, if anyone has any specific questions yeah. for Prof Hinchcliffe, yeah, we, yeah, please please put them in the chat. I think we may have a few minutes. Um, yeah. So thank you so much. That was really insightful and a really good overview of clinical academia and the different parts of the role, particularly as you progress through the pathway. I think there's some really practical advice there that we can all take through into the future. Um, I'll give that another minute for any questions. Uh, but if not, we'll move on to our speakers. So I'll give it another minute and then we'll see. So if not, we'll take any questions for the speakers uh, um, after they've all spoken. Um, thank you so much, Prof Hinchcliffe. We will move on to Dr. Kitty Wong. Um, who has co-founded the Access the AFP, absolutely brilliant, and has now got an academic clinical fellow post in vascular surgery in seven. So please take it away. Hi, everyone. I hope you can hear me all right, just say if, if it's not working. Um, hi, I'm Kitty. So as Maya said, I've just finished my two years of the academic programme or the SFP as it's known now. Uh, and I'm now an academic clinical fellow in vascular surgery in seven. So I've just been asked to sort of spend a few minutes on how I arrived where I am now, why I think the SFP VAS is valuable and why you should do it, and sort of just a brief um, introduction to the ACF. So during medical school, I actually never did an intercalated degree because, quite frankly, I couldn't really afford it as an international student. But I think, like a lot of you here today, I suspect I got involved in research by sort of by chance really and actually found I really enjoyed it. So I applied to the AFP here in Bristol mainly to give myself time to do research alongside my clinical work. Um, I wanted to keep working with the team in Bristol and I wanted to see where a career in clinical academia was for me. Um, so luckily I got into the seven deanery. Um, here is where I sort of got a little bit unconventional. So I knew that I wanted to go into vascular surgery but in Bristol they offer a limited themed AFP posts or SFP posts per specialty. So for example, there were two in surgery, one in renal medicine, one in pediatrics, one in GP, et cetera. And so I didn't actually manage to get a surgical themed job. And instead I took up a renal themed SFP job and I'll kind of come back to the pros and cons of this. So in terms of what the SFP has been like for me for the past year, um, so in F1, I was purely clinical like everyone else. So there was no dedicated academic time, but uh, I managed to do a few projects sort of on the side in my own time, including finding this course. 
Um, and in F2 in Bristol, what we do is there's a four month research block where you work four days a week in research and one day clinical day release, and then two clinical blocks with a one day academic day release. Um, and you also get dedicated weekly teaching as well, um, as well as discounted access to some of these short courses offered by the University of Bristol, which I found very helpful personally. For my research block of the renal team, so my project was a lab-based project, which realistically could only really be done during the dedicated four-month block. And although it wasn't really what I wanted to do in terms of my clinical career, I was able to work with the team to sort of tailor it to some of my interests. Um, and actually, you know, I learned a lot of lab-based skills and got exposed to a lot of other uh, lab-based projects I otherwise probably wouldn't have been exposed to, um, which, you know, and the other thing is I got a feel for what sort of research I liked and didn't like, which I would argue is probably just as important as well. And in my clinical rotations, because of the academic release days, I was actually able to do some other surgical projects of my own. So um, I managed to do a few systematic reviews, two of which have now contributed to uh, updating some international guidelines. I worked with the UK amputation specialty interest group with Prof Hinchwith and uh, with the James Lynn Alliance for some priority setting to identify key research priorities. And I was able to network with a lot of researchers, both within Bristol as well as kind of nationally and internationally as well, which was really valuable. Um, the other side thing I found really good from an academic point of view is that particularly if you were stuck on a job where it was mostly service provision and a bit boring if it's not a specialty you want to do, I found that the academic days actually gave me a chance to do a lot of stimulating work, which I probably wouldn't have had the chance to do otherwise. Um, the caveat is, of course, uh, you have to be very organised and on the ball, really, um, to take full advantage of the opportunities that are given to you. And you do sort of get out of it what you put into it as an academic trainee. So sometimes this does mean having to work outside of your allocated academic time, because as we all know, abstract deadlines don't wait for the academic days. And of course, this is on top of having to meet all your clinical competencies and building your CV for sort of applying to future specialties as well. Um, although the SFP itself does massively help with this. So overall, I would really enjoyed my academic time and I'm glad I did the SFP, even if it wasn't immediately related to my area of interest. And I think it's interesting to bring that up because a lot of people are concerned about the project not being completely related or tailored to the exact specialty in their research interest, or if you're not 100% sure what you actually want to do as a clinical specialty. Um, I still think in all of those circumstances, the SFP is still really valuable. And if anything, it will give you the time and the resources to pursue an academic project. Um, and like Maya said, it's kind of like a why not situation rather than why should you do it, in my opinion. So a little bit about the ACF, if you do decide to kind of pursue the clinical academic pathway after the SFP, the next step would be the academic clinical fellow, which is usually a three year program with 25% um, of academic time or four years in GP training. You can apply for an ACF sort of anywhere between the completion of foundation training to ST4, so it's not um, adhered to certain stages of training like the SFP is. And the ACF post can either be such a specialty theme, for example, in vascular surgery like me, or renal medicine, or acute internal medicine, anything basically. Um, or it can be an NIHR priority research theme where there is kind of a wider, broader, multidisciplinary research areas rather than confined to a single specialty in itself. And the goals of the ACF post is kind of similar to the SFP. So basically you get dedicated research time, you get access to funding from the university that you're associated with, you get access to sort of master's level research training. And most importantly, the goal of the ACF is to support you to um, complete a research training fellowship application process to apply for funding to undertake higher research. So usually this might be a PhD or an MD, or if you're on a kind of re uh, education pathway, this might be supporting you to get a higher degree in medical education. Um, and certainly if you are planning on going down the clinical academic pathway, then having an SFP post is really good on your CV. It's often listed as a desirable criteria because you would have already demonstrated your ability to balance clinical and academic work. You would have had some formal teaching and research methodology or education, and you've obviously will have had some research experience as well. Um, so I think overall, um, the SFP programme is absolutely worth it, in my opinion. 
Um, I think everyone should give it serious thought in terms of, uh, you know, thinking about projects you want to undertake or anything outside of just your clinical work that you want to spend time in. And certainly for me, I think looking back, it's definitely a why not situation. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Kitty. If we keep any questions for Kitty until the end, um, we can post them in the chat and we'll do a Q&A session afterwards. Um, so moving on to Dr. Liam Delaney, who's an academic F2 in Sheffield. Hi, thank you to the um, I hope you can all hear me. Um, so yes, uh, as uh, Maya said, my name's Liam. I'm uh, working currently in Sheffield as a, an academic FY2 as of about five days ago. So I'm currently on my academic block. Um, so I studied as an undergraduate in Sheffield, uh, sorry, in Edinburgh, um, and um, I did an intercalation there in anaesthetics, um, which was kind of my first introduction into research. So I did a lab based project, which actually I didn't particularly enjoy. Um, I didn't really like my kind of time there, but I still had this idea that I wanted to do research and had had some interest in research. Um, I then did a student selected component later in my uni degree, um, doing some kind of data and analytical stuff in, in neonatology, um, which I enjoyed a lot more. Um, and so I decided that doing an AFP or an SFP would be a really good opportunity to kind of explore my interest in uh, research further and just kind of see whether it was for me um, kind of further down the line. So kind of differently to a lot of other people, though, I didn't really know what specialty I wanted to to do. Um, leaving medical school, I was not really sure at all. Um, and then having started my um, my jobs, I, I've kind of found an interest in radiology and, and interventional radiology. Um, and I've, I kind of had decided that I wanted to to explore the field of AI um, and, and do some programming um, within my AFP. So I've kind of, you know, bundled that all together. Um, the good thing about Sheffield um, in particular, well, first of all, I really like the city and, and the Peak District and it's very outdoorsy if you like that sort of thing. Um, but within Sheffield and Yorkshire, you get a lot of scope to do whatever you like. So. Um, as Kitty was saying in, in, in kind of seven or um, I think there's you know specific themes that you get put into whereas within Yorkshire you kind of have scope to do whatever you want you don't get a specific theme to to research um, which has you know it's good and bad sides it means there's a lot more well there's a lot of onus on you to kind of come up with a project and decide what you want to do um, so I was kind of searching around, just sending off emails to to some radiologists, to some academic radiologists and trying to find um, uh, a, a supervisor um, and I've managed to kind of get a supervisor in the field of AI in um, CTPA in um, pulmonary hypertension, which is quite a niche area and not necessarily kind of what I want to do further down the line. but. I think the good thing about it is that, you know, it's going to give me the opportunity to kind of network with a lot of people and, and kind of gain some skills that I wouldn't have otherwise had the chance to do. Um, I think also having that four month block of time, which you get um, in Yorkshire is really good because it would be really difficult, I think, to do um, proper research um, if you only had six clinical blocks, because during my F1 year, I didn't have any day release or anything like that. So it was all clinical. Um, and I had tried to do some some stuff alongside that, um, but it is quite hard. So if you really think that you've got some inkling that you have an interest in, in research, then having that four month block of time is, is a good opportunity to kind of get your, get your teeth stuck into something and have a good go at taking a project from, from start to finish. Um, I think another good thing about Yorkshire is that they give you the chance to do a free PG cert in, in research methods if you're doing the research one or in um, education if, you, if you're doing the education um, kind of stream and obviously that's something that would cost uh, a lot of money but you get some elsewhere but you get this formal training for free which is a good thing to put on your CV and a good experience as well. Um, so in the main difficulties I'd say that I've found um, as I say during my F1 I, I've tried to do some projects and I had 
got involved during my orthopedic rotation in, in an audit, which is hopefully going to end up with a publication. Um, but it is a lot of time pressure and, and doing those modules as well for the PG cert is something you have to kind of do off your own back, which when you're getting home off, you know, long days on the wards and that sort of thing isn't always the easiest. So it's a lot of self drive um, and motivation that you need. Um, and also, I think something else to consider is just the time that you get out of clinical practice. So obviously, a whole block is dedicated to some sort of research where you're not on the wards. Um, and I think, you know, that it's fine and you, you, you can you can manage it and it's OK, but you do need to be really pre pre proactive and getting all your sign offs. Um, and also now my next time in hospital will be at the end of F2 because I've got a GP block after this. So I'll have been out of the hospital for eight months and I'll be kind of supposed to be a, a senior F2, but I won't have been in hospital. So that's why, you know, making sure you're really on top of things is uh, is is important. Um, but just to, so I think it's a really good opportunity to just get some skills that you wouldn't otherwise get. I think it's a good chance to kind of um, develop your own interests. I think you can really invest time in yourself. Um, so for example, I'm doing some coding courses alongside my research that I'm doing into AI, uh, um, into AI in, in, in chest radiology, um, which is hopefully some transferable skills that I'll be able to take out of the AFP further down the line. Um, and it gives you just, you know, a network. Uh, I mean, as everyone has said, it's really important to kind of just show your enthusiasm and your interest and just try and get to know people and, um, and that sort of thing. But uh, yeah, if anyone has any specific questions about anything, I'm happy to take them at the end. But thank you. Thanks so much, Liam. That was a really good insight into kind of the academic programme, particularly in Yorkshire. So thanks. Um, moving on to Ella, who is one of our committee members um, who is doing an academic um, job in Renal in London. Hi, thank you. So I'm Ella. I'm currently an F2 um, as of a few days ago in St George's in London. Um, so I'm doing a research SFP in renal, um, which I decided to apply for after I integrated at uni um, and really enjoyed. So talking a bit about my job. So I have a four month block um, where to do a pro research project um, my jobs in F1 were, I had general medicine, then I had a split job of liaison and perinatal psychiatry, trauma and orthopaedics, now on a four month renal placement, and then I have four months of um, academic renal and then finish on a and &E. um, I couldn't recommend it enough, I've had a really good experience so far. From the start, I've had a really enthusiastic and keen supervisor who has got all of the renal academic trainees um, to meet on a regular weekly basis. So we just had our first meeting with the new F1s um, and he is very keen to like get us all involved in projects throughout the department throughout our two years so that when it comes to our four month block, we kind of, the ball's already rolling. Um, and as well as that, we have monthly teaching on um, academic so it kind of ranges from the ethics of research to applying for grants to some more practical things like sample size calculations and also interesting talks from professors um, in the area it's like a joint teaching um, from guys and KCL um, so that's also really interesting um, and again I think similar to um, as one of the other speakers said we have also been able to apply had a bursary for the PG Cert Health um, Research, which has been really uh, a great opportunity as well. Um, and so throughout this, I've done an audit with the renal department when I was in F1, which um, I presented at a national conference. Um, and there's some other projects which I'm involved in now, which hopefully we will be able to wrap up within the next few months and send for publication. Um, I think I couldn't recommend it enough. I think it's repeating sort of what other people have said. I don't think you lose anything through applying. Um, it is quite an involved application process, which I would be prepared for. Um, but actually the time and hours you spend, for example, sorting out your CV and writing the white space questions and preparing for an interview, I think isn't time lost. And um, 
the interview practice I think is really beneficial even if you're not successful in the interview because um we don't really I think yeah we don't really have interviews since we started medical school until sometimes specialty training which is 10 years later so I think it's a good opportunity to have practice interviews and to get sort of CV in shape um and definitely I think the clinical scenarios in the interview is really useful for finals and for clinical practice as well um and then actually my experience of being an academic trainee so far has been I've really enjoyed it I think it's really rewarding and interesting it's really nice um to have that team around you and for example things like funding um is a lot easier when you've got a team and sort of projects which are already ongoing and um, you do still have to be organized and you still have to sort of reach the same clinical competencies as your peers um, in a shorter amount of clinical exposure um, yeah and I think so there I think even if you're unsuccessful in getting a post there are still ways to get into doing research within departments but I think that the biggest advantage is having that designated time um, and team to really spend time on it and work out if it's something that you enjoy um, to then sort of decide whether you want to go into it further down in your career. Thank you so much that was really really useful. Um, finally, last but not least, we've got George, who's doing an AFP in leadership and management in South Devon. Thank you, Maya. Um, uh, yeah, I'm George. Um, I've just finished the um, AFP in Torbay. Uh, so I'm, I'm just starting uh, an F3. Um, so I was asked first to, to speak about why I applied and um, I think there's kind of three important things for me in work and, and maybe maybe it, it might be the same for you too that it's really important to have a sense of purpose in your in your work and i think we all have that as doctors um and it's also important to have some autonomy at work and um, and lastly i think it's helpful to to feel like you have a, a unique offering so i was in the fourth year of medical school uh when i started thinking about afp and the place I came from uh, was that actually I'm okay at the clinical medicine um, and maybe I've got some particular skills there but on the whole I think you know maybe I'm not so good at the book work maybe I'm maybe I'm not the the best I'm not maybe I'm not going to be the best doctor that there that there is but I'm really enjoying doing some projects and they seem to be having real impact and I also previously relaunched a food charity and I really enjoyed that and building up a team. And I thought, well, maybe I, maybe I can leverage these skills. I've previously worked in social care as well um, in a management capacity. So I wonder, I wonder how I can translate this into um, my foundation programme. Um, and so I applied for the leadership uh, and management AFP um, in, in Torbay and the format for that has been a pretty much a normal F1 with three rotations and then uh, two clinical rotations, two six month clinical rotations in my F2 year. Um, and so I've had sort of roughly speaking, two days a week of academic time embedded within that final year. So those two six month blocks have been sort of less than full time clinical if you like. Um, and so in terms of what I've been doing, I mean, my, my interests are, are thinking about um, service design and disease pre prevention. Um, and so, I mean, that's taken me on a, on a slightly tangential path. I've ended up doing lots of projects actually um, in IT, which is a real problem in our hospital. And I found that I could represent junior doctors uh, in getting some systems changed and I felt that it was really important that we had mobile accessible guidelines uh, there'd been a couple of instances where um, in, where clinical events had happened whereby people didn't have access to the information at the bedside um, and I thought that's also an opportunity to leverage how we can um, 
how we can also make GPs work off the same guidelines that we're working off. So I, I took that through a procurement process and we've now got um, hopefully MicroGuide coming to, to Torbay. We're, we're slightly behind time to stand here. Um, and um, and so all guidelines will be over there. And 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 I've there's been around around six or seven projects that I've been running concurrently, um, and then also doing um, uh, a PG cert in in Plymouth, uh, and that was again funded for, much like Liam described up in Sheffield. Actually, um, it's been a fairly open format to to how things run. So you can decide to a large degree what you do with your time. Um, which has the same good and bad aspects that that, that were described by others. Um, so I think it's really good getting dedicated time devoted to less frenetic work that might have more lasting impact. And I've got to meet with a medical director once a fortnight who's been a huge support. Um, and I think the main downside for me is you get one fewer rotation. And for many rotations, that's fine. But in terms of, I don't know, GP or obs and gynae, they're actually quite difficult to do as an F3 if you haven't done them before. Um, and yet much of what I've done this year could have been rolled into a, an F3 quite quite easily, including a funded PG set. Um, so I think by all means, go for it. I think it's been a great opportunity for me. But I also don't think it will be a make or break as to um, your ultimate career opportunities and um, not say like getting into medical school was I think this you could see it like a nice to have maybe um, but I wouldn't hinge all of your hopes uh, on it because I, I don't think it it matters quite quite that much um, and so so in essence don't get too stressed about it um, you will see people turning up to interview with their multi-tone uh, portfolios in big files and I was not one of them um, so don't feel too small if you're not in that way and I'll stop there. Cheers thank you so much George I think that was really nice to hear a slightly more alternative path and a bit more of a <laughs> chilled out um, approach to the SFPs as well. Um, so if anyone's got any questions for any of our speakers or anything more general please post it in the chat um, and we'll go about answering those as best we can. If not, um, we will probably answer any other questions in one of our upcoming webinars um, these are the dates for them so take a note and if you follow the qr code you can get to the pre-course questionnaire to register for the link so we've got a question for george what cv things do you think are relevant for the management sfp um a uh, good question, Ella. And I should add that I'm more than happy um, if people want, if if uh, you want to grab my email address, I'll, I'll put it in the chat, and you can um, ask more specifically. So I came into um, I came into medicine as a graduate, who, um, so I'd got some previous things to draw upon. I think an interest more than anything in how we design services in health in healthcare. Um, and any any research projects are, are definitely uh, very applicable because um, there's uh, Dixon Wood and other thinkers on this subject think that we should we should do all of our sort of service development from a from a sort of research um, perspective. So I think anything in a research or education domain is is also really important, and I can well believe that. You'd find it difficult to get leadership opportunities um, in medical school. But of course, you can, if you so wish, and I, I didn't necessarily do this, but um, uh, you could consider taking representative positions in your medical school, for instance, would be, would be one obvious option. But also, you could um, have some experience in the voluntary sector or, or wherever else it might be. Um, I don't think this has to be something that's 
really well formed Ella you'll find that me and other people on this program um don't necessarily all have a leadership background we're not all really confident leaders in arriving um to f1 uh, so they're not expecting that um so i think this is probably for anyone if you're interested in a particular speciality but are offered an sfp without a job in that speciality how would you go about getting that clinical experience example for future speciality applications So I would say that, you know, you could got, you've got taster days um, that you could go to. Um, you could potentially do an F3 in that specialty. Um, and depending on the deanery as well, you get to choose your kind of clinical rotations um, after you've been offered a post. So you will have some kind of, um, you will have some choice as to what rotations you exactly want to have. Um, most of the time, the F2, for example, in the Severn deanery, I would say is very broad based. So you end up doing like most people end up doing kind of ICU, GP, A and E kind of jobs in F2. So again, that kind of leaves things open and you might get the experience that you wanted anyway, is what I would say. Yeah, Just to sort of add on to that as well from an academic point of view, there is absolutely no reason why you can't do other projects outside of the one you are assigned as well. So like for me, Although I was assigned that particular renal project, I obviously did that project with the renal team, but at the same time, I used my academic time for other projects as well, which you know you can spend in pretty much any specialty you like, and it can be as broad or as focused on any specialty you like. So there's really like no limit and no contract saying you can't do other things. Um, and again, like Antonia said, there's plenty of opportunity for you to seek out both clinical and academic opportunities as well outside of what you've been allocated. Yeah, and I think that's not a situation which is unique to the SFP either. I think that happens quite commonly um, with any type of foundation training. And you can do taster weeks as well, depending on your deanery and if they can have the capacity to allow you to do it. Um, but I did a taster week earlier this year, which was really useful. And um, so that's another option. So I think if we don't have any other questions, we'll probably end the webinar there. If people can please fill out the feedback form in order to get your certificates to show that you've attended, that would be really great. It means that our speakers can get some feedback um, and we can improve the webinar as well.